I'm Mindy Mesmer. I'm a scientist and co-founder of New Hampshire Science and Public Health Task Force. And we are a group of loosely knit, <clears throat> loosely knit about 35 uh, medical professionals, scientists, healthcare professionals in the state of New Hampshire that has been operating since about March 6th, uh, trying to input uh, our opinions into the decision-making process, so specifically around COVID-19 uh, pandemic um, response here in New Hampshire. We've issued uh, a bunch of letters, I wanna say like six or seven letters, about three or four right to no requests um, along the way and talking about things like the importance of wearing masks and contact tracing and uh, the way the state is responding to the pandemic. Uh, this recent letter, although we have many concerns, the top concerns that we have um, today have to do with contact tracing and mask wearing and the fact that there has been a 10 time, tenfold increase in the number of cases of COVID-19 here in the state of New Hampshire in the last 60 days. As we head into the um, holiday season, we felt that this was an important issue to raise uh, to the governor. We have today submitted a right to know request pursuant to 91A, rule RSA 91A, asking the governor to provide us with detailed account of the $61 million in CARES Act funding that was allocated to the state of New Hampshire for contact tracing and testing. We'd like to know what happened to that money uh, in our right to know request, which I believe everyone could have looked at if they wanted to, has a timeline which outlines some of the public statements that were made by both the governor and uh, public health officials in the state of New Hampshire along the way about the importance of contact tracing and then to our uh, dismay, the abandonment of that program as of we think last week uh, when public statements were made by the governor in a press conference. Uh, so we're asking for an accounting of the monies spent, uh, the $60 million, $61 million allocated through the CARES Act Fund. Uh, but also we wanted to uh, have a discussion today and uh, um, open it up to the press um, to try to talk about some of the issues that we think are really important. Uh, I'm joined here by um, five public health task force members who will present various uh, parts of our uh, concerns to you. Dr. Nora Travis from Keene. Uh, uh, Rich DePantima from Portsmouth, Dr. Dr. Michael Dow of uh, Guilford, Dr. Alan Addis of Newcastle, and Dr. Ben Lachwin of Portsmouth are here to join us and to present uh, various aspects of our concerns laid out in our press release today. Uh, so I want to start with turning it over to um, Dr. Addis to talk about the importance of our, our item number one, which was mandating masks and uh, face coverings in all public areas um, and the CDC, uh, discuss, the CDC uh, recommendations around that. So Dr. Addis, can I switch to you? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mindy. Um, I, everybody's heard about the CDC recommendations over and over, and I'm not going to bore you by going over them again. Um, I did my training in San Francisco just at the time that the HIV pandemic was beginning. In fact, it was when the disease was labeled GRID and not even HIV. Um, and I got to say, during that time, it showed me what a cooperative effort among citizens, among government, and among regulators, all those people, the impact it could make in controlling a deadly disease. We are in an area that is even more deadly, not in terms of mortality, because every one of my patients back then died, but so easily spread unknowingly. And this is so easy from a medical perspective. It is extraordinarily easy. There has to be a people who get together with government, not politically, but medically not philosophically, but scientifically, not Republican or Democrat, but 
what Isaac Newton would have said at the time he developed calculus, which is wear a mask. It's been shown to be effective. Indeed, healthcare workers who are masked and who wear goggles do not have a higher rate of COVID-19 as does the general population. Masks and social distancing work. They work well. Potentially, according to Anthony Fauci, and I don't want to use him as the holy grail, but he is right on this one. Masks and social distancing and washing your hands well will reduce the spread of this disease as much as a vaccine. Now, we approach, if we haven't reached, 250,000 Americans dead. Or maybe four planes a day crashing into places. We've, at least I've seen among um, physicians and people that somehow the science has gotten abrogated by and diminished from politics, the right not to wear a mask. People have a right not to be infected. My 91-year-old mother should be able to walk the streets without somebody coughing on her, not wearing a mask. My son, who is immunosuppressed, or the people going in and out of Dana-Farber should not worry about somebody bumping into them because they're not social distancing. And we need leadership. I think the population, physicians certainly, and scientists all know what's true. What's needed is somebody with some degree of courage and some ability to remove the R or the D in front of their name and take a leadership role in this. And obviously in New Hampshire, that's Governor Sununu. This is an abject failure of him not to do this. This really depresses medical people. My wife is an ICU nurse. ICU nurses every day are risking their lives. Give us a break. We take care of all people who do things they shouldn't have done. We will continue to take care and do our best at our risk to take care of everybody who comes in with COVID-19, no matter what their politics or whether or not they voted for Biden or Trump. But do medicine and medical people and nurses and respiratory techs a favor. Wear a goddamn mask. Stay away from people. Wash your hands. You're Americans. I, I am so troubled that this has become a civil rights issue. And Mindy, I am really depressed and shocked that the government in the state of New Hampshire has not taken every means possible to prevent death, destruction, sickness in their state that is so, so easily done. I'll be happy to answer questions later. Thank you very much, Dr. Addis. Um, just wanna make a note that I should have said at the beginning, if you have questions, uh, first we'll hear from each of our panelists and at the end we'll take questions uh, that come up in the chat, uh, first comes first serve, and then we'll follow up with other questions live if we have time, but we're gonna try and keep this to about 45 minutes if we're hoping. Uh, the next person we'd like to hear from is Dr. Michael Dow of Guilford, New Hampshire. Thank you, Mandy. Um, yeah, I just completely agree with it, what Dr. Addis said about wearing of masks and um, really the need for leadership from the governor and all public officials, because it really is a no-brainer. And just to keep it maybe on the positive side, 
um, we can, if everybody wears masks, we can avoid a lot of the things, even economic problems that people want to avoid. If we, mer if we uh, all comply and wear masks, we're going to have fewer shutdowns. People are going to be able to go back to work earlier. People are going to be able to go back to doing everything they want to do, meeting their family members earlier, because it is incredibly effective. And, and um, as we've heard from Dr. Fauci and the CDC, we have some promising vaccine candidates out there, but they're really not going to be available to the general public until um, at least the early to mid portion of next year and probably won't be seeing the effectiveness um, to be able to stop doing social distancing and masks until possibly even 2022. So just a couple things about um, masks that people probably already know, but it, it, it protects the wearer, but it also is protecting the general public. And the more that people in the community use masks, it's sort of a synergistic effect. Um, so a couple of studies that I could talk about briefly that are from the CDC. Um, there was a study in um, Springfield, Missouri, there were as a hair salon where the policy was that all of the workers and um, customers had to wear masks. So they had a mandatory mask policy in that hair salon. And they had two uh, hairstylists that became symptomatically ill with COVID. And those uh, hairstylists had interacted with 139 clients over an eight day period. And they were able to contact about 70 of those clients, have them interviewed and tested and 0% of them developed COVID. So, um, you know, other studies have been done out of uh, Beijing with um, households that wore masks, the, the reduction of uh, transmission um, to family members was about an 80% reduction um, in countries such as um, um, Taiwan, where mask usage is common. The amount of um, COVID transmissions has been incredibly low. The famous uh, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, you know, um, aircraft carrier outbreak. Um, they found that the, the uh, soldiers who were using, or sailors who were using face coverings on board um, was associated with a 70% reduction um, in COVID risks. So it's really, really strong evidence. Um, there was an economic analysis done, and this is in the CDC uh, website, that um, using US data, um, that if we could just increase universal mask use by 15%, this could prevent the need for lockdowns and uh, reduce associated losses of up to a trillion dollars or about 5% of the GDP. So, you know, all the data I think supports that when we use masks, um, we're going to prevent the disease and save money. You know, paradoxically, what some of the people that are saying we shouldn't have to wear masks so that we can all, you know, go back to work and be free, that's exactly the wrong approach. What we want to do is make sure that we don't get sick so that we can keep businesses open. Um, you can't just have wishful thinking, so. And again, I'd be happy to answer questions later at the end as well. Thank you, Dr. Doe. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Ben Lockwin of Portsmouth, who's going to speak about uh, the importance of um, being able to open our restaurants and bars safely and conduct ourselves in public settings. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, members of the press, for joining us this afternoon. I wish it was under better, more positive circumstances, but um, item number two from our task force recommendations was that we recommend that the governor and the NHDHHS should mandate that gatherings be limited to fewer than 10 people, including avoiding dwelling inside bars and restaurants and other facilities with inadequate ventilation for any extended period of time. So, I mean, what we do know about the aerosol nature of transmission of respiratory infections in general is that the longer you're um, in the presence of the air volume, which is contaminated with pathogen, the greater the likelihood is of transmission. Um, we also do know that, um, you know, with the synergistic use of uh, mask wearing and also social distancing, we can help to mitigate many of those risks, not all of them. Um, we would also like to state too though that residents should get takeout to support local businesses. I totally understand the toll on businesses across the state and the nation as a result of the pandemic. Um, to reiterate the sentiment though that we have among the Science and Public Health Task Force, it's a false choice between controlling the virus and um, looking out for the economy because public health and economic well-being are inextricably linked. We can't have a healthy economy with 
robust pub without robust public health. And um, I think also the flip side of that coin is public health is at its best when there's a thriving economy. So the two things are inextricably linked and intermingled necessarily. Um, so the recommendation really is that people who enter restaurants and bars, even for takeout, should wear masks or face coverings. Uh, people should be maintaining a minimum of six feet distance between individuals, as long as those people are not members of their immediate families. And the governor and the NHDHHS should also issue strong guidelines for um, hand washing and hygiene and also for the social and physical distancing. It's important to note too that philosophically and principally, uh, six feet was really never and still isn't a sufficient distance. We've recovered respiratory droplets from coughs and sneezes from 27 feet or more from the source. The six feet was originally sort of a um, misunderstood minimum for larger droplet particles to descend under gravity and not, not really a hard and fast rule as far as distancing for an imaginary barrier of safe versus not safe. Um, so ensuring that there's regular and frequent cleaning of, of uh, high touch surfaces, so that could be door handles going in and out of restaurants if people go in for takeout, um, restrooms as well. We um, saw a news report that uh, WMUR uh, had put out that 12 of the recent community outbreaks were traced to visits to restaurants and bars. Um, you know, and it's unfortunate that we have to rely on analyzed contact tracing statistics to come out of a news outlet and not from the state's assessment and management of the situation. Um, I know that there are several restaurants in the Seacoast area, which were the nexus of positive COVID-19 cases that had no tracing conducted in some cases for up to two weeks or even at all and for which the restaurants uh, still have remained open. And so what we know is that it's guaranteed that cases will increase. Viruses do what viruses do, and that's that they spread through naive members of the population. Um, by having reduced resources within the state for contact tracing, and therefore not understanding where and how we'll cut off these infectious vectors of the situation, basically what we're doing um, at a state level is tacitly acknowledging that cases are going to continue to occur and that we'll do nothing in order to effectively prevent them. Um, I think I'll part here just by saying, you know, a portion of my work has been to provide oversight to some of the vaccine candidates that are in the pipeline now, um, which are going to help change the trajectory of the pandemic in the next year. Um, I've been involved in many of the clinical trials, but I will say and echo what um, <clears throat> Michael said is it's not a panacea. We still need to modify behaviors and approaches at the community level in a preventive way because even when the vaccine's available, we're not gonna have 100% inoculation with a vaccine. So we have to prevent cases from occurring because that's much more effective than treating those cases which have already occurred. Thank you, Ben. Um, that was really helpful. Uh, I also, I'm appreciative of your efforts in, in helping us all understand uh, the vaccine, you and Dr. Dow, the, the, the issues around the vaccines uh, so that people don't let down their guard prematurely right now. Um, I'm gonna go to uh, Rich DePentima um, for his discussion about the importance of contact tracing and what the state should be doing in terms of contact tracing. I think you have to unmute. Okay, I am unmuted, thank you. Uh, thank you members of the press for being here with us today. Um, I've been in public health for over 30 years before I retired. And um, one of the things I did very often in my 30 year career was contact tracing for many, many different communicable diseases from HIV to TB to foodborne outbreaks uh, to meningitis to many other diseases. Contact tracing is one of the most basic and most important aspects, and one of the most important tools public health has to control outbreaks of disease in communities. It is the hallmark of the control of communicable diseases, especially diseases from which you have no vaccine, and also with minimal treatments available to people. What's happening today in this society is that we are facing a, a disease that is easily transmissible. And many people who are transmitting the disease are asymptomatic. So when we identify cases through testing and we do not follow up on the contacts, 
we are then allowing the potential spread unknowingly by other people who may be infected. They may not know they become infected and they will continue to spread this disease in the community. We learned that during the outbreak of uh, COVID in China, each individual contact case had about 45 contacts. China at that time hired over 9,000 new contact tracers and trained them in Wuhan alone to manage the outbreak of this disease in Wuhan, China. That is how you control an epidemic. Don't throw up your hands and say, well, I'm sorry, there are too many cases now because we didn't do what we had to do in the beginning in terms of requiring masks and doing the amount of contact tracing that was required when we had a more stable numbers of cases to control. Now we have hundreds of cases, new cases every day that need to be contacted and all their contacts need to be identified and notified about their potential exposure, their close contacts. If we fail to do that, and it looks like we have failed to do that, this disease will run rampant through the community and we will see very large increases in the numbers of deaths and the numbers of cases. And we will see the large numbers of school closings and other places of business having to curtail their operations because either they will have no workers available to work because they're, they're too sick, or we will have no other means of controlling the disease. So we are begging that the governor rethink his position on contact tracing. We not need to shrink contact tracing in the face of increasing cases. We need to expand it, and we need to expand it quickly. We need to find retired public health workers. We need to get other retired physicians and nurses who will be able to learn quickly how to do contact tracing and get them on board to start doing this work. And we need to start it yesterday. This is vital. If we don't do this, it will only make the situation more catastrophic than it already is. You know, when we see the positivity rate now, as of the 18th of this month, going up to 8% positivity rate. So all those contacts that, that people have, that cases have, you could assume that about 8% of them potentially might be infected if they get tested. We just went from a lot less than 1% positivity rate up to 8%. And we only had in the beginning of the epidemics about 7% 7 7 of how many contact traces we needed to do the job. And that was when the cases were relatively small. So now the amount of people we need for contact tracing has exponentially increased. And we're doing nothing about it except throwing up our hands and saying, okay, virus, you won. We have to wait now for a vaccine and just be happy, be merry, don't wear a mask if you don't want to and uh, go out and do your thing. This is irresponsible, it's dangerous, and it needs to stop. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I'd refer you back to an article I wrote for the New Hampshire Sunday uh, News back in May the, May the 10th. Uh, it was published in uh, Medical Sunday and it was called COVID-19 Sleuths Begin Contact Tracing. I outlined at that point in May, the needs for contact tracing and how important it was and obviously that was uh, totally disregarded. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dipentima. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our right to know request. Uh, there was a timeline provided in our right to know request um, that laid out some of the public statements made by the state New Hampshire Department of um, Health and Human Services and the governor uh, since about September 24th. In a press conference uh, in, on September 24th, Dr. Daly laid out um, the fact that about 110 contact tracers were actively employed by the state of New Hampshire at that time. Uh, and I just wanna sort of tie the, the thread between the reason the contact tracing is so important is because that people are shedding the virus while they're asymptomatic, meaning they have no symptoms of having the disease that they recognize themselves yet they are shedding the virus and transmitting it to other people. So this is why it is so critical to make sure that we get ahead of this with contact tracing to identify as quickly as possible uh, the, um, the possible uh, people that have been exposed to the virus unknowingly. Uh, and there are recommendations on the CDC's website for 
how, how this should be done and that all contacts should be traced within 48 hours, et cetera. So this isn't something that you know, people are making up. These are CDC guidelines that are specifying how this should be, ha how this should be happening uh, in all states, not just New Hampshire, in all countries. Uh, on September 24th, so Dr. Daly admitted there were 110 contact tracers. On October 1st, during a press conference, uh, Governor Sununu said that uh, he thinks the numbers are going up of COVID cases, but our testing capacity and contact tracing capacity is huge. We're gonna be successful. We have the tools we need. There is an end in sight. On October 8th, um, he talked about, um, Governor Sununu then talking about the asymptomatic spread uh, and that people are shedding the virus unknowingly uh, and causing the, con the contagion to spread. Um, and so that he said the contact tracing efforts have been a huge benefit because as soon as someone's identified, we can quarantine them. Um, on October, November 5th, he talked about the surgical nature of the contact tracing program and how it done, had done a tremendous job of really outlining um, internally where the numbers are and what we have to do to stem or shut down the, the contagion and the spread. But then on November 12th, not even a week later, Governor Sununu announced the comprehensive and specific contact tracing program by DHHS would end. Uh, as these numbers, um, as Rich covered, were going up tenfold in the state of New Hampshire um, with an 8% maximum positivity rate of cases. Uh, so we felt uh, on doing some digging that there was $61 million of CARES Act funding allocated to the state of New Hampshire uh, for contact tracing and testing. And we wanted to know uh, what this money had been spent on, exactly how many contact tracers were or the maximum number of contact tracers that have been, held, uh, that have been employed by the state of New Hampshire uh, so that we can get an idea of whether there's monies left over uh, so that we can push to make sure that this contact tracing program is extended uh, through the, you know, the highest rate of uh, positivity increase of cases in the state of New Hampshire. So we will let um, the um, people on this call and the public know the response that we get. I did get a confirmation from the governor's office that they did receive our um, RSA request this morning. Um, they have five days to respond and generally what they do is they say, we've got your request, but we need more time. Uh, so we don't expect a response to this anytime necessarily soon, but we've asked for invoices and uh, all sorts of information so that we can understand how the money has been spent and whether there is any money left. So I would like to turn it now to Dr. Nora Travis to sort of um, summarize before we head to questions and answers, uh, why this matters to the people of New Hampshire and a little bit about her work in this area as well. Thank you so much, Mindy. Um, my background is in exposure assessment science and aerosol science, so the science of transmission of particles. And the key takeaway about COVID-19 is that it is a virus that's a particle that is a, and that exposure to COVID-19 is a function of time and concentration. And what my colleagues are sharing and emphasizing is how to reduce that concentration by masks, by physical distancing, uh, by reducing crowd size, by reducing close contact, and by basically reducing exposure to the source. And what's important to keep in mind besides these efforts is also ventilation which is something that hasn't gotten a lot of um, coverage, but it is another important thing that can help our local businesses to pay attention to ventilation as that will dilute uh, concentration of the virus in indoor spaces. As next week is a big travel week and there will be a lot of movement of people into our state and gatherings, this is why we wanted to uh, get together today to bring attention to this matter with the lack of contact tracing and the surge that could happen next week over the Thanksgiving holidays, it becomes really important to reduce contact and reduce exposure risk. And the real key here beyond public health that Dr. Lachlan so eloquently made the connection is also to our economy and to protecting 
vulnerable populations within our communities. New Hampshire has many assisted living and nursing home um, centers. Residents in nursing homes and assisted living cannot move. And they are in indoor settings with close contact with people that move throughout the community. And with high community spread, that places them at an incredibly high level of risk. So it becomes incumbent to do these risk reduction member measures so that we can reduce risk to our vulnerable populations and also keep our economies open. As the schools close and as uh, healthcare workers get sick, as people get sick, they will not spend money in our local communities. They will not be going outside and helping small businesses. So by uh, implementing public health measures, we'll also be taking important measures to keep our small businesses vibrant. And finally, it's important to keep in mind that most of New Hampshire is a very rural state. We have small hospitals in many locations in our rural counties that uh, can be swiftly overwhelmed with cases and hospitalizations. And so we, uh, I just want to emphasize that the failure to control the virus can overwhelm the medical system as well as uh, hurt our economy and the measures that we're uh, recommending today can stop that. And so uh, we want to call upon all people to uh, participate in these measures. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Travis. Uh, now we will open it up to question and answers. There are quite a few questions in the thread. If you have a question you want to put it in the chat thread, we can take those on a, a first come basis. And after that, we can take uh, live questions. But first, I wanted to address one of the questions. If you uh, want to help out, certainly stay tuned, stay involved with us. We will keep you apprised of the response we get from the governor's office, but also it doesn't hurt to put a little pressure on. Uh, if you I put in the chat thread how to contact the governor, I know they have to uh, record all the phone calls that come into the office uh, if you want to express your sentiments there. It also helps to uh, write letters to the editor and put them in our newspapers in the state of New Hampshire, the Concord Monitor, the Union Leader, the Seacoast Papers, uh, and express your feelings about this. Um, all the pressure that we can put on this situation would help, um, I think, in making sure that the right thing happens here in New Hampshire. Uh, so there's a question first off from uh, Timothy, Representative Timothy Horrigan of Dover, uh, Durham, sorry, um, asking whether or not the Grapponi Center and the National Guard have been used or CDBUs, I'm not sure what that is, but um, uh, I think WMER reported that the Grapponi Center was being used for contact tracing. And does anyone have knowledge that they want to share about this as a panelist? I have no knowledge of that uh, personally. Okay. Um, Susan Richman uh, asked about how to um, support the efforts. So we just I did uh, cover that, writing letters to the editor, making phone calls to the governor's office um, and talking it up, sharing our posts on social media. Um, Dr. Travis and others have set up a Facebook group, New Hampshire Science and Public Health Task Force which we're gonna to try to keep um, as live as we can with new information. Um, and just follow all of us, if you could, on Twitter and Facebook and share our information because I think the more people that hear about this, the more likely it is we can make change. Uh, Joanne, sorry, someone was gonna make it. Mindy, I was gonna to reply to your uh, previous question. I believe that Employment Security has been using the Grapponi Center as a call center, not DHHS. Okay. I know at one point there was talk of them using it for contact tracers, but. Well, it might have changed, but the yeah. last thing we knew, that's what it was. Yep. Great. Thank you, Peter. Yep. Um, Joanne asked, is the state getting any info from other states that are having good percentage of contact tracing? My daughter does contact tracing for New York City Public Health Department and will be working while she visits us Thanksgiving. 
she does get breaks, one for dinner. <laughs> uh, does anyone know of uh, stories, maybe Ben or um, Alan Addis or Rich uh, or even Nora about other states, uh, how they're doing with contact tracing and whether it's been effective? Well, well, I do know that Massachusetts uh, uh, started a massive program back in the spring uh, to recruit and hire uh, many, many, many more new contact tracers uh, to be employed by the state uh, to do that kind of work. Um, and I mentioned that in my article I wrote in May 10th, and I employed, uh, implored that the governor here do the same in terms of seeking out and trying to hire as many contact tracers and train them uh, as possible because uh, uh, failure to not uh, do the contact tracing is just going to uh, result in more cases and um, it's just going to get to the point where now where, where we find ourselves today that it's almost impossible to do catch up when you have 200 plus cases a day and each one has a, a potential for four to five contacts that's over a thousand contacts a day that need to be identified and those people have to be followed up it's not just a one-time deal where you call them once and say oh by the way you've been exposed uh, try to get tested and you should stay in your house and be quarantined for 14 days. It requires constant follow-up during that quarantine period if they are in fact quarantined and who's monitoring that quarantine. And then you in fact you're adding on every day another thousand or more contacts every day. Cumulative numbers uh, become so overwhelming that uh, it's beyond uh, the capability of the state. And so they just thrown up their hands. Anyone else like to comment on that from the panel? Okay, um, I've heard a question from Pete Marcotte. I've heard that in some states or cities, the response rate to contact tracers is only 60%. What's the rate in New Hampshire? What is an ideal rate? Are there automatic, uh, automated tra tracing methods that can be more efficient and perhaps less costly? Does anyone comment? 60% well, is not great, but uh, it's better than 0%. Ideally, 100% would be the best. Uh, and it's a difficult process, you know, to do contact tracing. First, you have to get from the index case who their contacts were and what kind of contact information they may have on those individuals. Phone numbers, email address, uh, home address, and other means of trying to contact uh, these folks. There's also recently been the advent of using cell phones in terms of contact uh, tracing, or at least people who've been exposed to a like a facility like a restaurant and you could track if they've been in that restaurant uh, uh, during the period where they may have been exposed. So there are various means, but the old shoe leather epidemiology method is the most tried and true. And that's a good point, uh, Rich, because in the past few weeks, I think there have been 13 outbreaks associated with either restaurants or actually 14 as of yesterday, restaurants or other um, like gatherings in the state of New Hampshire. Yep. Someone asked Carla, uh, I put the link to the Facebook page in the chat thread. Um, and we have, I think, run out of, unless I missed someone, questions that are in the thread. If anyone wants to ask another couple of quick questions. Oh, there's a question from Congresswoman Carol Shea Porter. We saw political rallies that had more than 100 people, but Governor Sununu did not enforce masks. Should the people who attended those political rallies in the last month of the election be, I want to assume she's going to say tested. And, I, and for myself, I know this was a big source of frustration because they clearly violated the emergency order uh, that Governor Sununu uh, put in place, which outlawed the rallies of more, you know, social gatherings of more than 100 people in the state of New Hampshire, although no one ever stepped in to stop them. Um, I would, I'll just go out on a limb here and say, absolutely, if you're at those rallies, you should at least be uh, quarantined uh, for at least a period of 10 to 14 days and, and or be tested uh, because we know there have been outbreaks associated with those rallies. And you know, this is another issue that happened. There were a lot of campaign events that were held throughout the state of New Hampshire uh, on a, you know, a certain side of a certain political party where no one was wearing masks, which was a big, concern of mine and those probably were also uh, you know uh, sources of infection here in the state of New Hampshire that we're now seeing which is why we're seeing the rate of increase in, in cases and if you look at the relative rate of new cases in the state of New Hampshire uh, versus the population of New, of New York uh, City 
and then the rate of increase in the cases there, we have a much higher rate of positive increase uh, per population than the city of New, of New York does. Um, Nancy West, uh, thank you for joining us, Nancy, uh, from In Depth, Depth, New Hampshire. Is there any way to say how many lives could have been saved in New Hampshire with mandatory mask order and increased contact tracing? Uh, I, I think that's a, a very good question. Unfortunately, we probably don't know the answer to that, but we do know uh, if you look at the number of cases um, and the potential how many of those could have been avoided uh, if masks were worn, if we have a 70% effect, effectiveness rate of, of masks, the transmission uh, in the community of the virus would have declined by about 70% potentially. So if we look at the, and extrapolate that number of 70% fewer cases and of the looking at the, the case fatality rate, then from there you can uh, get a fairly, uh, you know, soft estimate of, of how many people may have been uh, saved if we had uh, had the mask order. Could I comment on that also? Yes. Um, it's really, really important to look at the future. Um, 250, and I, and you know, somebody said this is like peeing in one end of the swimming pool and expect it not to affect the other end. Um, it's not only New Hampshire. People travel here all the time. The one thing I want to emphasize is that we do not want to be the only state without some type of mandate. We do not want to be banned or have people not allowed to come into the state, including tourists and including people who go to ski resorts. Um, you want to act in concert. We're 50 ships in a big, big ocean. And we all want to go in the same direction because that will save lives all over the place. To say how many people could have been saved or not been saved, I think we owe it to the people who are now deceased to help those who still are alive and have a chance at leading a full, long life from something that is, to me, a reversible, um, unnecessary death. Can I add one point to that? I, I agree with that, Doctor, 100%. And, but I think we also have to be careful about focusing on mortality as the only indicator to measure the impact of this disease. We need to look at morbidity as well. Many, many people are so-called recovered from this disease, 90 some odd percent, but those folks were pretty sick. Many of them were very sick. Many of them will have lasting uh, consequences of this virus, but to their organ systems and their cardiovascular system, their pulmonary systems, et cetera, et cetera. So simply because an individual did not die from this does not mean that we don't have other consequences uh, from this disease from people who became infected. And it also overwhelmed our healthcare delivery system because so many of these people required intensive care and other uh, extensive medical treatment, even though they didn't succumb to the virus. So this is a, a tremendous impact. And we don't know the natural history of this virus yet. We've only been dealing with this virus for 10 months. So we don't understand the natural history. We don't know what the long-term implications will be for individuals who've been infected with this virus down the road. So we need to think about more than just mortality. We need to look at the whole spectrum uh, of the consequences of this virus from infection through morbid, morbidity and mortality. And I would add, um, I would add really quickly that um, across the state, our school districts are shutting down. And they're shutting down not because of outbreaks in schools. The schools have been pretty good. The schools have masking and ventilation. But the schools have to shut down because of community spread. And because of community spread, now this is you know, hurting public education for K through 12. And so uh, I would echo what they're saying, not to just look at mortality, but quality of life, as well as impact on our kids and vulnerable populations. And I'd just like to follow up a little bit. This was laid out in our letter, but the it spikes in cases that we're seeing now 
won't be recognized in our hospital system for another three weeks. So it's important to understand that, you know, people may look right now at the hospitalization rate and think it's not too bad. Well, the cases that we're seeing right now, the spikes that we're seeing right now, aren't gonna start showing up for the next two to three weeks in our hospitals. So one of our big concerns is the, you know, as Dr. Addis had talked about and Dr. Dow had talked about was the impact on our, our healthcare workers here in the state of New Hampshire and our hospital system. Uh, there was a question from James Sorrell about the Executive Council, whether they had reviewed the money um, allocated by the CARES Act. No, they had not. Um, they were uh, circumvented. Uh, the governor has uh, allocated CARES Act funding without going through our typical uh, fiscal checks here in the state of New Hampshire. It's the Executive Council, but there's also a legislative body, fiscal committee, uh, which have been circumvented for the allocation of these CARES Act funding. And the Supreme Court upheld that uh, in the last few weeks as well. So no, the Executive Council has not reviewed the uh, $61 million in CARES Act funding. Um, Eileen Flockhart asked, did we, have a did we not have a National Guard trained in contact tra tra tracing? Can we urge the governor to reinstate them? Um, also, the time frame between contact tracing and testing can be critical. How can we tighten that time frame? So this is definitely, you know, a manpower issue. Uh, the more contact traces you have, the more likely it is you'll be able to tighten that time frame. Um, and then the testing time frame. I think, you know, maybe Ben can talk about this a little bit. There was just yesterday an announcement or today, maybe uh, about a in-home. A quick response test um, and whether that would be helpful to us here in the state of New Hampshire and in, in trying to refine that testing, you know, shrink down that testing period. But I'm not sure about the National Guard, so maybe someone else can address that one. But then, uh, well, I was, I, I was actually in the National Guard. Uh, okay. in the, I was a public health officer in the National Guard, so um, we didn't do uh, contact tracing per se. Uh, and uh, we weren't trained specifically to do it, but those of us who were public health professionals were trained to do it. But there is a cap capability, a uh, small capability within the Air National Guard. I know I'm not too familiar with the Army National Guard, but there are, there are some public health folks that work uh, part-timers uh, in the uh, Air National Guard that uh, I'm sure could be um, uh, utilized if they haven't already been uh, tapped to, uh, to assist with contact tracing. So we have about two more minutes. Um, ben, do you, or does anyone have anything to say about the testing, those new rapid tests that came out um, that were approved today or yesterday? Yeah, so <clears throat> as everyone probably heard, the FDA uh, issued an EUA, which is an emergency use authorization, and it's for uh, self-test to be done at home for COVID-19. It's produced by a company called Lucera. And it's intended to, to report back results in about 30 minutes. So this test kit comes with uh, nasal swab samples. It has um, the, this battery pack, and it basically helps you with um, putting this thing into the nasopharynx to be able to take a swab. It's got a sample vial, the test unit itself, and batteries, and a disposable bag for the waste. Um, the emergency use authorization by the FDA isn't a full approval, but the idea is if this can be put into widespread use, then it could potentially help with uh, attenuating some behaviors. Although I think some of the challenge too is even when people have returned positive cases, they are you know, being expected to self-quarantine and isolate from society, and that's not really happening. I just saw on Monday this week, somebody was in a, uh, in a local pharmacy on the seacoast and they were talking on their cell phone with a cloth mask on and said, yeah, I just got my COVID test back and it was positive. And here they were, you know, day, day zero of having known. So, you know, maybe day seven or eight of infection and they're out in public at the drugstore picking up, you know, Pepsi and pistachios and whatever else they think are just essential items to have. So, you know, e even knowing isn't potentially enough, but it at least gets us somewhere better. And maybe we can cover the last question from Nancy West really quickly. Um, uh, Nancy West from In-Depth New Hampshire, thank you for joining us. Why do you think the number of deaths in nursing homes are relatively low? Have all the vulnerable residents died already? Yeah, I think. <laughs> Go ahead, then. 
Now, I was just going to say, I, I have, you know, earlier on in, in this pandemic, so looking back over the past eight months, at the front end of things, we obviously had had a lot of concern within the task force um, regarding elderly care facilities, nursing homes. Um, certainly, there was a higher proportion of uh, deaths. There were uh, certainly issues with uh, significant morbidity situations. I, I, I don't know, though, the current situation regarding um, the death rates in, in nursing homes and elderly care facilities now to see that the rate has dropped from what it had been, so I'm not sure. Okay, great. Well, Mindy, yes, Mindy, I, I have one question. Uh, uh, people who, who end up positive, in many cases, they can't self-isolate. They have no place to isolate. Has anybody tried to set up a system that would provide people with that kind of solution? Well, that, oh, that, I think that's, James, the question, you, that's the question, both for isolation and for quarantine. For people who need to have support systems in place, if you're required to be isolated, you have to have a facility. If you don't have one in your home where you can do it safely, you need to have a facility where you're going to be monitored, you're going to have food, you're going to have medical care, you're going to have all the things you need for that period of time. The same is true for those people who are supposed to be in quarantine. You just can't call them, say, geez, you know, it'd be nice if you stayed home for 14 days, hang up the phone and never talk to them again. When I wrote a pandemic plan for the city of Manchester, we had put into that plan that we would take over a specific hotel in the city of Manchester to do exactly that, to put people who needed to be isolated uh, or quarantined in that facility if they didn't have a proper place to be. Ben, did you want to comment also? No, I think, I think James had posted that in the chat window as well. I think I had read that, just making sure that it was covered for him. But, but I think uh, Nancy did send a note to me and just asked if this was being recorded, if she could get a copy. So Absolutely, it is. Right. Yep. Uh, Dr. Woodward. I'd just to say UNH has got a couple of dorms. Uh, it's sending all this. Is that they've used for students who are quarantined. Uh, they have the food service capability. Uh, they're about to send all their, everybody home, at least everybody that's not already in that dorm. That I haven't heard the decision on that yet. Um, the, it, it would seem like, at least for the SECO community, mm -hmm. that would be an opportunity. If the university is hurting for financial reasons, if some of the uh, state money could be used to support the food service, that would seem to be an opportunity. Thank you. Great. Okay, I think we're going to end it here. Thank you so much to all of the panelists, to all the members of the Science and Public Health Task Force, to all the members of the press, and to everyone on the call. Um, it is critical for all of us to stay involved and make sure that we hold our government responsible. Um, I put back in the chat again the phone number and the contact information for the governor's office. Please call them um, or email them. I don't have the email off the top of my head, but you can find it. And uh, join us on Facebook and share uh, our information on public media, on social media publicly. Thanks a lot. Have a great day, everyone.